whom I admire very much and I always feel humbled to be here and of course um, I was just interviewed by uh, a, a dear uh, a correspondent of the local newspaper talking about what Kösek means for me. Kösek means, as I said, coming home. Why? It is not only because I was also brought up in the countryside and this is a special way to be, to, to be brought up in Hungary. You are brought up in a little, I was brought up in a little village, so I was always hoping to know more about the world. I learned everything about the village, which was a very multicultural, beautiful village, very picturesque, just like her said. A lot of people living there uh, from different backgrounds, different nationalities, different ethnic origins. So this is how I was brought up. But I knew I had to leave. I wanted to go to Budapest. When I learned Budapest, I knew I had to leave. I wanted to move on. And this is really a driving force, I would say, in many of our lives, that we want to understand the world. We want to understand our microcosm, as Leila Bartók would say, and me as originally a pianist, I always go back to the great examples of musicians and their thoughts when he said that he wanted to serve the idea of the friendship and brotherhood of people. And he said that before the UN was set up. He said he wanted to serve the people through his music, and for that he is not someone who is not interested in everybody. He said that he is interested in all the music. The only problem for him was to look for the music coming from the clear spring. But I know you know that. So we are all interested, obviously, I believe, in the global context, what we do, where we are coming from, because that's the only way we can understand, first of all, ourselves. I also say in diplomacy that if we are having a kind of um, sure body envelope where we create the understanding about ourselves, then we are not afraid stepping out from this body envelope. Then we are not afraid stepping out and being interested in the other person. But first we have to understand who we are, and for that we need, we talked about that many times here in Kursak as well, great education so that we could be not afraid, we should be not afraid of stepping out and understanding what the world is like around us. I'm also at home because I'm a great admirer of Professor uh, Miss Livets and Professor Jody Jensen. They have created a miracle here in Kursen, and I can say that not only because I've been friends, uh, but I've been someone who has seen it in the last, I would say, 13, 14 years since I've been coming here uh, uh, regularly. I've seen how you, the students, have been coming pouring from different parts of the world, and the whole point was to create the summer university and to create I Ask, because we would like to understand you, and we are interested in your questions, because without the new questions, how could we find the new answers in the world for the serious problems, the serious uh, cul-de-sacs, what we can experience. And of course, I feel at home, especially when I feel um, former colleagues like uh, Ambassador Emil Biggs. We've been together to London. It was a long time ago, about 20 years. That time, we both run the culture institution. Emil uh, ran the Austrian Culture Forum, which was a very established, beautiful culture center. And I set up the Hungarian Culture Center. So um, we all have different walks of lives, living in different parts of the world, but sometimes we just meet up 
And then it's also very interesting to see how we are doing and what advice or experience we can give to each other. So that's, and of course, Professor Kramer just came into the room. I'm so happy you are here. Uh, I am I, really uh, very on, on, honored, Professor Kramer. I mean, I came from New York, he came from San Francisco. And um, uh, he, he, we met the last time in Harvard, but I was very happy that the very last time we really worked together, it was in the United Nations, when after 60 years I managed to open the secret uh, files about the 1956 revolution in the archives of the UN and in Columbia University. And we thought it was something very special. I have to say that um, it was not easy for 60 years, no one dared to really ask to open up these files. And of course, what I did, first I went to the Russian ambassador, then I went to the US ambassador, then I went to the secretary general, then I went to the political uh, under secretary general, and then I went to the professors, then I went to the academia, because finally we had the chance to see what's going on, and one of the professors of this university who will be here tomorrow is already writing about that, and um, and you are um, you are you are I think you are publishing something together with uh, with Andras, and I I'm very happy that with I ask with the institution with Professor Misilet, um, uh we managed to publish a book. Uh, about this whole process, which was edi edited by Professor Jensen. And I'm just telling you, there is a little statue in front of this wonderful room, and this is the statue what we created. This is a statue, a cry for freedom, which I believe is a symbol of the 1956 revolution. Okay, so that was a short introduction. I know I have probably 15 minutes more. And I was asked really to talk about why multiculture, uh, why multilateralism, and really what is the role or what can be the role of um, uh, Hungary and Central Europe and the European Union in the United Nations. And I have a great lecture, you know, this is always happening and of course I won't read it because it will, you know, give us no time to talk about anything. Uh, so I would like to say, to start with that, of course when we are here in Kursa and we discuss topics about Hungary, Central Europe, uh, Visegrad countries, the European Union. We look from here towards these bigger formations like circles of Central Europe, circles of the Visegrad countries, circle of the European Union. But when I work in the United Nations, and I've been working there now for more than 10 years already, first I was a UNESCO ambassador in Paris and now in New York, uh, as UN ambassador, I must say that Hungary is a small country. Mm -hmm. I must say that Visegrad countries, not very well known. I must say European Union, 28 countries. And then there is G77 and China and all the developing world. Mm -hmm. So obviously you have to know how to be able to talk about your problems and how to be able to talk about your issues related to your country, to Central Europe and to the European Union within the global context. And this is a different way of making diplomacy. That is why I believe that in a way, as I say, multilateralism is getting more and more important because of course there are different ways of multilateral organizations but the highest level of that, it is the United Nations, which is, of course, under a constant reform. Because just think about when it was set up, uh, with the idea, actually, of Béla Bartók, who had the idea before the UN was set up, uh, the whole concept was that there were five very strong countries who who were instrumental making peace and winning the war, who became the central pillars of the Security Council. Old China doesn't exist anymore. Old Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Old United Kingdom doesn't exist anymore. Old France doesn't exist anymore. United States, we can talk about that. So there is a construction which still is the most important 
power in the United Nations, and this is the Security Council in which the P5, so the five permanent members, are not the members who they were in 2045. So obviously, all the new powers coming up would like to see their space and their strengths in the United Nations system. Now we as Hungary, we will never be, of course, a permanent member. We even, I don't know when, will be a non-permanent member in the United uh, Nations Security Council. We were in the 90s, actually. But I wanted to say that the whole Eastern European group has changed totally after 1990. Before that, it was the kind of Soviet bloc. After 1990, it became the post-Soviet and the post-Yugoslav bloc. So all the countries are now in the Eastern European bloc. And of course, part of these countries are members of the European Union, and part of the countries are not. So it is already a starting problem that the Eastern European countries, and in which we have the Baltic states who actually wanted to join the Western European countries, they, but they were not allowed. So they had to join the East European countries, uh, the Central European countries, so the so-called Visegrad countries, are all here in the East European group. And actually, in this group, we can't really have political discussion because we have our political discussions within the, the European Union group. But the European Union is not a permanent member of the UN, but has a special role and a special right to speak, to coordinate. So whenever we would like to be strong enough, we have to coordinate with the European Union members, because of course, if we speak on behalf of the European Union, or we ally ourselves with the European Union, we are stronger. On the other hand, I remember very well when I was um, uh, campaigning for becoming president at UNESCO General Assembly, my friends told me from the developing world, don't focus on European Union. So if you want to be successful in the United Nations as Hungarian, as a Central European, as an Eastern European, you have to find the countries whom you can work together. And these countries are not always the countries in the European Union, it, these are not always the countries only in Central Europe. It's very important how we set up our relationship with the United States and of course with the great powers like China or India. And the, European, the United Nations is a very special kind of family because it depends a lot how the ambassador is moving ahead and building up very strong personal relationships with other ambassadors. Little groups are moving forward important topics. And for that, you have to find really uh, the partners wherever you go. I must say, although it is very small, this Visegrad country group, but it is a very influential group. You would have never thought what we have actually achieved within the United Nations. For example, just think about last year. Last year was the main thematic issue was, of course, global compact on migration. And the United States, uh, you know, disassociated itself immediately from the whole uh, process. And my idea was this is not a very good idea for us. We are too small. We have to stay at the table of multilateralism. Plus, it gives Hungary a chance to say, to say, to influence, to be around. And actually, we worked very strongly together with the Central European countries. And this is, of course, another occasion to discuss. But the result of the Global Compact of Migration was not as such a big success as it could have become if all the relevant ideas, concepts, and viewpoints would have been integrated. But they were not. And as you know, five voted with no, like us, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Israel, and the USA. 12 abstained, and 24 did not vote. You know what it means? 
It means they are not in the room, and they are not in the room because they don't want to vote. So it means that they did not vote for. So actually, the result was not as brilliant as many um, processes would have sought. And I would like to say that that was really because of the very strong collaboration of the Central European countries and their influence towards other countries as well, especially putting the problems on the tables and to discuss how we can move forward. But this is, of course, just one issue. I would like to say that uh, it, in, the, in the United Nations, it depends a lot in what format you are working together with other countries. For example, at the moment, I'm vice president of the UN Women Ex Board. It means that uh, all the issues about empowerment of women and gender equality is something what is in the forefront of the work of, your, of UN Women. And you are, of course, not only representing your country, you are representing the Eastern European bloc, but you are able to work together with everybody in the whole world. The same way um, we are uh, giving the vice presidency at the moment for the uh, Committee of the Rights of People with Disabilities. Again, a very important issue here in Hungary, but because it is a global issue where we play as uh, vice president, we are able to put our interest uh, after we discussed with our groups on the table of the global uh, era. It's very difficult to say that uh, a Central European or an Eastern European country could really uh, move uh, mountains in the United Nations. Because, as I said, we are not in this position. But we are in the position in we are raising our voices, where we are visible, so that people would understand what we want. And for that, you just have to work as a good diplomat and have to really find the countries whom you are collaborating with. So this whole summer university, as I saw today, is about collaboration. The collaborations, the formats of collaborations, of course, are different. They were different in the 90s, as we heard in the morning. That time, Russia was not really a very important player. And that time, the P5 worked beautifully together. After Russia came, sort of woke, woke up, I would say, again, it's very difficult at the moment to have a consensus, for example, between Russia and the United States. So we see this tension again, which is uh, very alarming in the United Nations. We don't know exactly where we are going to, but of course, as China is sitting as a P5, uh, and is very strongly working together with Russia. And of course, as France and UK are sitting as P5, working strongly together with the US, this fight is a, a struggling experience for all of us. It's very difficult to have a consensus. What I see is a big uh, difference between uh, the period of 1990 and today in the United Nations that less and less consensus can be reached. Before, somehow, the countries were more ready to look for a consensus. Today, I see that more and more countries are concerned about their own interests and about their own voices, although they know exactly that they can't have a resolution, they can't have really any kind of instrument which would help uh, in the development if there is no consensus or at least there is no collaboration. Uh, I think that uh, from the reform period we can say that there is a strong secretary general who would like to really modernize this, uh, the, the United Nations. For that he needs the full support of the member states. The Uni European Union is a firm supporter of the Secretary General. We are supporting his idea of reforming the United Nations because it is still like a big ship, you know, a big boat moving very slowly. Uh, but there are countries who would never give up their status quo. Uh, 
Having said that, for example, uh, we have a special group of people, it's called ACT, Accountability, Coherence and Transparency. More and more countries are joining us, not only from the European Union, but from all parts of the world. So obviously, the work of the United Nations has to be much more coherent and transparent. This is, of course, a journey what has already resulted a much more democratic way of using the Secretary General, because last time we already had interviews with the, uh, the candidates. Uh, the, it, it, it couldn't happen just behind the closed doors amongst the P5, what it has been going on for, for many decades in the history of the United Nations. And also the General Assembly President, which is, of course, the, the highest rank because the person represents all the member states. Uh, uh, election has become much more transparent. So I think the process of the reform in the United Nations in which uh, the Visegrad countries and Central Europe can play a more and more and more role uh, has become much more dominant. So we can uh, have our say much uh, more vividly. And, uh, and I also would like to say that um, we, at the moment, I'm talking about Hungary, we have a very strong and good relationship with the United Nations, uh, with the United States. There are a lot of topics in which we are working uh, together. And uh, of course, the, the, the position of the United States is something what influences very strongly the work of the United Nations today. Uh, they are, we always see the differences, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican-led government. Uh, Republican-led governments in the United States are not very much supporting the international organizations, but so far a part of uh, the Paris Accord, we have been able to work together with them. And even Nikki Haley, who is a fantastic politician and, uh, and uh, was the permanent representative of the US, wanted to have a much bigger cut in the, um, in the budget, did not really manage because even the US had to collaborate with other countries. So we have a chance, we have our voice, we are vivid, we are uh, visible, uh, but without collaboration, no way that we can move on in the global forum. And uh, lastly, I would say I really believe in multilateralism, uh, and I think that what happened here around 1989 and 90 is something what we are now introducing more and more, to the international uh, forum, also hoping to work on that with uh, I ask, because I really believe that the United Nations should also be a kind of a laboratory of ideas, but this is also a question of discussion, how intellectual approach and how just sheer political interest approach is enough in the, in the future. Of, uh, of our international organizations. I think we have to think, we have to act, and we have to collaborate together. That would have been my short introduction to the topic. Thank you very much.